Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Hey, thanks a lot, Global Patties, and thank you, Sherry, for that great message. Everybody, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate you being here. You know, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor support. They help make all of this happen and provide us the ability to bring you each episode. With that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. And while you're there, check out Bee Culture's Beekeeping, your first three years, a quarterly magazine for beginning beekeepers. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsor this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinators. Learn more in our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor and our occasional guest co-host, Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. Hey, everybody, thanks again for joining us. We have an informative show all set for you in this episode with Dan Conlon and, and his update on the Russian honeybees and EAS. Yeah, Jeff, it's uh, it's good to have Dan back, touch base on Russian bees again. Um, uh, he, yeah. Uh, brings a lot back and, and reinforces some of the good things going on with the program. And then, of course, he was associated with EAS when it was going to be in Massachusetts. The university there took one look outside and said, nope, we're shutting the doors until 2022 and all this goes away. So EAS was stuck with, well, what do we do now? And the good people from Kentucky raised their hand and said, we've got a, we've got a place that we can go and make it work. It's not going to be quite the same. But uh, Dan can tell you the details. That's good. I'm glad to hear that uh, there's going to be some form of EAS meeting this summer. Uh, I, I'm encouraged by the progress they're making in rolling out the, the vaccine. And, and hopefully we get this year behind us and uh, beekeeping meetings can come back and everyone will be back to quote unquote normal. <laughs> I'm, I'm impressed with the people who are putting this together. I was associated with EAS for yeah, you were. Decades. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I was even president twice, and, and having to be president in, under these conditions would be a real a real stretch. So uh, hats off to the good people at EAS making it work. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, speaking of making things work, uh, we there a couple episodes ago, we talked about uh, Chinese tallow, and uh, there's been some changes on that as well, haven't there? Well, there's a, a comment period open on uh, the USDA is looking to bring in some some uh, pests for it because it's an introduced species and, and there are beekeepers who don't want it to go away and there are landowners who want it to go away. So there's a comment period. It was supposed to close in February. They got it stretched until April. So if you have an opinion one way or another about Chinese tallow and getting rid of it, um, go, you know, check it out and uh, put your two cents worth in because um, the USDA is going to move on it. Yep. That's your opportunity. And clarifications, oxalic acid. Last uh, last episode, we talked about the, the announcement that kind of squeaked up uh, and became the rage across the Internet is the rewriting or, of the uh, acceptable traceable amounts of OA and honey. Yeah, I it, it's still I guess it's been sorted out but not in my not in my head. I'm still not sure I understand exactly what's going on and until I see a new label or I have somebody smarter than me can you know uh, explain it to me. I you know my only advice is stay tuned uh follow the existing label and don't do something you shouldn't because you can get us all in trouble. That's right. The label is the law, and the law is the label, I think, is the way that little meme goes. So, 
Yeah, stay tuned. There'll be a lot about that, uh, both in uh, all the national organizations and uh, possibly here in a Beekeeping Today podcast, we get the right person involved. You know, each week we ask uh, listeners to send us some questions and comments, and we've been receiving them lately, haven't we, Kim? Yeah, there have, and some good questions, and I think, Jeff, we should start reading some of those. Why don't we plan on that next week. Yeah, let's do that. I think that's a great idea. And uh, folks, if you uh, send in a question or comment and you do not want it read online, let us know and (laughs) and we we will hold your name out. And uh, either way, we'll just probably paraphrase uh, questions or comments and uh, it'll be good. I think everyone can learn from it. And I'm going to bet that that every every question that we get probably represents questions in listeners' minds. A whole lot of other people are thinking the same thing. There's just, you know, one or two right in. So uh, maybe we can uh, uh, inform a lot of people about some of the questions that have come in. So, and finally, Kim, you and Jim are doing a great job on Honeybee Obscura. I really enjoy listening to them. Uh, you guys have I like those quick, deep dives and discussion back and forth of, of the topics you have uh, put together. How's that going? It's going good, Jeff. We're having fun. Um, we kind of do it in clumps. We'll do, we'll do four or five in, in one day, and then we take a couple weeks off, and then we'll do four or five. But that couple weeks off gives us some time to plan and to research the topics that we're covering so that we have a pretty good background. we got a couple coming up, one on bee space. I mean, that's just something every beekeeper knows until you look into it a little bit deeper, and then there's a little bit more to it you <laughs> might want to find out. It's swarm season. Uh, bees are beginning to swarm and, and, and down south and ours are going to swarm up here pretty quick. So we're going to talk about swarms, but we got some other ones coming up. One of them's on robbing and, and robbing is an adventure. It's an event and it can be horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, preventing it and explaining it and what to do about it. We look at that. We're looking at pollen traps. I'm, I'm, I'm the world's strongest advocate for having pollen traps, at least on some of your hives, because that pollen is free food for next spring. Uh, and why beekeepers don't take advantage of it just amazes me. But you know what we just found, Jeff? Hmm. I was digging around in my library here, and and tucked behind a whole bunch of books was a, there about 100 years ago, maybe 110, the, the root company put out a whole bunch of really small pamphlets that you could get for a nickel. Hmm. And they were on all sorts of topics, all sorts of topics, everything that you could imagine as a topic. So they explained it in using the knowledge and the language that they had 120 years ago. One of them was a dictionary of beekeeping terms, (laughs) which is amazing. The words, some of them haven't changed a bit, and some of them you have never heard of once, I can guarantee you. And the other thing, that another one that we found was 150 questions. And amazingly, they have not changed hardly at all. The questions asked and the answers given. So uh, we're going to look at that and kind of explain what some of these terms might have meant and then look at the questions and say, why hasn't this changed? And the obvious answer was they were right the first time. <laughs> you know, that's it's cool because that's really kind of the the leading edge of technology at that time where the pamphlets, much like your podcast, Honeybee Obscura. Yep. It's just short yep, yep. little vignettes of, of useful, valuable information. Well, they were fun to do. And and uh, we've also brought up one of the things we're looking at talking about are some of the really older authors. Uh, I don't mean older authors today. I mean older authors 150 years ago, what they were writing about, uh, what was uh, what were the hot topics of the day and why and, and who was doing the writing and where they're punch and counterpunch efforts going on. So we're looking at some of those topics too, because some things have changed and, you know, don't exist anymore. And other things are talking today. Wow. I look forward to it. And <laughs> finally, Kim, you know, you're one of the best read beekeepers I know. What have you been reading lately? Yeah. Uh, always reading. That's, that's what I do. That's what I do best. I think <laughs> I got a new book by Ed Simon. And you know Ed Simon, he's got the articles mostly in bee culture, but some other places on how to build things, how to make things. And he's got a new book 
right now it's so new that it's not available almost anywhere, but I'm sure that you'll be able to find it on Wickwas Press, who publishes other book and probably all the other places you find bee books. So just uh, go looking for Ed Simons. But it's called Build Your Own Beekeeping Equipment. Straightforward title. Um, it's It's got 207 pages, costs about $25. And let me tell you a little bit about how he does it this time. He, what, what he did, Jeff, was he took the things that you do in beekeeping, like like um, your hive or this, the way you deal with honey or, you know, the way you deal with wax. He took those and broke them into pieces. And then he took, he took like the honey. He says, um, when you, when you, when you, when he talks about honey, he produces eight different tools to deal with honey. And, you know, they're, it's all about honey. And it's, you know, there's an escape board for getting rid of your bees. There's a drum dolly. Have you ever tried to move a drum of honey without a dolly? And and a warming box and dip trays and the, the drum heating pod and the warming box for drums. is It's really clever the way he did it. He's got a small scale uh, wax processor, sque- a screener and a strainer that, that you can get, you know, like at your local hardware store, the stuff and put it together. But I got to tell you the value of this book. The last chapter is entitled What Your Mentor Forgot to Tell You. If you've been keeping bees for a while, there's a lot of things you begin taking for granted. And you don't even think to tell people about it because you just always do it. Let me let me let me tell you about about some of them. How to attach comb to a, a wild comb to a frame. How do you do that? You know, that's not something you do every day so you don't think about telling a, a student about it. Dividing a colony and then putting a colony back together. How do you take two colonies and make one? There's a trick. A trick. Hive stand common sense. How do you clean your equipment? How do you get your bees to a bee yard? And how do you get them out of that bee yard? Uh, things you don't think about. How do you light a smoker and make sure that it keeps? It just goes on and on and on. It's just there's a hundred tips and tricks. And it rose to the top of my pile of books I think every beekeeper should have. And if even if you're commercial, a drum dolly, for instance, even if you're a commercial or a big sideliner, there's something in your, in this book you can you can learn from and use. So it's called Building Beekeeping Equipment. Build Your Own Beekeeping Equipment by Ed Simon. Jeff, go out and get a copy today. I think I will. It sounds like a great one. And I'd love to read that part about the 100 things your mentor forgot to tell you. Yep, yep. Hello, beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops, holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees' digestion and improve your honeybee's response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe to use product. Strong Microbials Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, with us right now, we have Dan Conlon. Dan, welcome back to Beekeeper Today podcast. Thank you, Jeff. It's good to be back. Hey, it's good to see you again, Dan. Good to see you, Kim. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Dan uh, was on a while back, and he was uh, talking about Russian bees a while ago. Today, he's wearing two hats. He's going to talk, bring us up to date on the Russian bee uh, group. And then he was, until recently, associated with the EAS meeting in Massachusetts that isn't going to be in Massachusetts anymore. So he's going to tell us about what's going on with that and what uh, people can uh, look forward to this summer for EAS. So, Dan, you are the vice president of the Russian group. How is the Russian group doing? Uh, Generally, we're doing pretty well. Uh, You can imagine that the COVID pandemic has uh, stalled a few things. But we're still functioning pretty well. The bees did not uh, miss a step all summer, so we we had to do all the bee work. We had our annual meeting for the first time by by uh, Zoom, which was a, a treat for everybody. Uh, but we were able to get our business done, and uh, 
I stepped down as president. Austin Smith is now the new president, but I agreed to stay on as his VP, uh, and uh, which is which is great. So we've readjusted some of the positions. As of last year, not this year, because I'll, I'll get to that in a second, our uh, PO, POAs or probability of assignment, which tells us that the breeding stock is still representative of the original stock, is still very much intact. And we've seen it actually the percentage of uh, purity or uh, Tom Rinder would, would scold me on that one because he doesn't <laughs> like using the word purity. But the point is, it tells us the original stock is still there, still contains the same genetics. And uh, we've increased our selection to uh, where we used to pick them at, pick our breeding queens at about 65%. We're up to about 75%, with many of us having 100% uh, POAs to select from. So we've actually improved our ability to breed what we would call pure Russian queens that can be used in the breeding program. Up, uh, in, in fact, we also were tested tested for the the stuff we've been selling to other beekeepers, the commercial production of queens and bees. And even with those, uh, and Tom in the lab had done this work before he retired, but also they did it again. And basically, it looks like about 50% of the queens we sell to people qualify as breeding queens at this point, as far as the uh, the uh, genetics we're looking for. So that was really good news. And uh, if you want to read more detail about that, get a copy of Tom Rinderer's book on the Russian honeybee. It's a great history of what has been done with the lab. Uh, even if you're not interested in keeping Russian bees, it's a great explanation of all the defense mechanisms found in honeybees and how they work. And it's uh, written in a language that uh, you can understand. It's not too too scientific, uh, but it's a great book and it has a lot of good information about bees. I would not recommend it as a beginner's book, by the way. I'd, I'd say somebody a little more intermediate or advanced would get more out of it, but it's certainly worth getting a copy of. Hey, Dan, are you still working with uh, the Bee Lab and to test the quality of your queens? We work with the uh, Baton Rouge Bee Lab, uh, the ARS uh, USDA lab, and that's the genetics, the honeybee genetics lab. And since COVID had uh, arrived in Louisiana, uh, lab workers have been working pretty much from home and they haven't been allowed to really go into the lab to work. So a lot of our testing and follow-up that the lab has traditionally done for us did not happen this year. And that was somewhat of a, a problem for us. We won't get our DNA samples cleared until they get back to work. And then it It'll be well past. We're already we've already selected breeding stock for this year, so we're going we're really relying on the fact that we had some good purity in the past, and we're going to be able to continue that lineage through this year too. And eventually, the lab will get back to back to work, and they'll they'll test the samples we've sent to them, uh, and then we'll know exactly where we are. We do know through trial and error how to correct any problems with that, by the way, which was another one of the tests that Tom was looking at was we did have a dip in the quality of the breeding stock in, uh, and I may get this wrong, I think back in two, 2010. And uh, there was a lot of talk about it. So we, we, we started a new, we changed our management of, of how we would, uh, would mate these these queens and we went to something called drone flooding where we put a lot more energy into getting uh, the right quality drones and made sure we had way more than we needed in our mating locations and that brought our our quality right back up it took us one season and we saw everybody's uh, stock improve right in one season so that was another thing Tom writes about in his book we, you know, breeders did not know that could happen in the past. So some of the stuff that's in that book is, is unique and new, new information, even for experienced breeders. Dan, let me interrupt you for a second here. Just briefly, how do you, sure, sure. how do you drone flood a, a breeding area? Well, I get uh, breeder queens from all the other members who do not have my breeding lines. I have two. Most members have two. Some, some are carrying a couple more extras. 
But all those come to me, and the first thing we do with those is we get those queens started. And we've gone over to using nukes instead of queens in the mail, uh, which has proven to be a much better system. And the first thing the guys who work with me do is we graft all those queens and we produce more of the same. So we end up with about you know, about uh, 15 different genetic breeding lines from the drones. And we create, uh, uh, what we have been doing is we set up our mating yards with about a dozen of each of those lines. So you can imagine we're using, we're using almost 100 colonies just for the drones in these mating areas, which is a lot of drones, by the way. And they represent 15 different uh, genetic sources. So uh, that's how we flood it. And then the timing is, of course, to pay attention to when you've got a lot of drones capped and count ahead about, uh, you know, two, three weeks and start waiting for them to hatch out. Then you got to give them another week or two to mature sexually. And then, uh, then you're in business. And your grafting is pretty much pointless until you get to that point. You may as well wait. People don't understand that sometimes when I say we haven't started Queens yet. And they'll go, but it's been so nice and warm for the last last three or four weeks. And I'm going, yeah, that's <laughs> just getting my drone numbers up, you know. So that's how we flood it. We're trying to put as many drones in the air at the critical times as we can. And, and for me, each of us has to do it a little differently uh, Manly Bygod out in Iowa and I probably do it similarly, same time, same schedule. Uh, Chris Hewitt in Virginia, probably same schedule. Uh, but a lot of the guys in the South, they're, they're starting now. They're starting to build up their graph queen cells and build up their drone sources now. So they're way ahead of us. And we really can only produce queens up here mid-May to June, and then there's a kind of a gap in July, and we can do another short run in, in August a lot of the time, but that's it, too. We have two shots at Queens, so I don't know. I think that might answer your question. Yeah, good. Thanks. That's nice to know. We're saturating the area with the drones we want. We're, we're really looking for, when we do these tests, we're measuring the colonies, the colonies' uh, likelihood of being uh uh, representing the, the the past genetics or the original genetics, individual bees may not have that still because you know you can get that stray Italian in the in the mating yard too. So you may have one here or there, but that doesn't overall that doesn't make any difference. <laughs> so the other thing we've been doing is uh, I've been doing a lot of these Zoom meetings. At first, I was pretty uh, didn't care for it. I like to be in front of people where I'm talking to people, but. Uh, uh, they've been helpful because we can I can just send, sort of stay at home and tune in, not have to travel all over the place to talk to clubs. Uh, so, and there's been a lot of interest. People have signed me up to do these things on the Russian program and Russian how we raise queens. And uh, so far, I've talked to the Rhode Island clubs, uh, North Fork County in Massachusetts, several of the New York clubs. I'm doing a I'm doing a uh, one in Tennessee for, I think, five or six of the or county organizations together. And then I'm coming out there to, Mad going to be there for Medina County, the association. So that's on the, in March. So there, you know, people are specifically asking about Russian bees and Russian management. So there's been a lot of growing interest in all of that. Yeah, Dan, speaking of which, and I know we've covered this in an earlier podcast, and I'll have those links in the show notes. Can you briefly describe why a beekeeper should consider keeping and or changing to Russian bees at this point? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the first thing I can say about Russian bees is we just don't see the problems with the viruses and the diseases that other lines of bees seem to have or other races seem to be getting. So you start out with that. They do have some weaknesses, and I'll, I'll be honest with you what those are. Deformed wing virus shows up. But I think that's across the board for all of our bees. And, and the other one that I've had some issues with is European fowl brood. But it's not been a big deal. We get, we've, we've had a couple of lab-tested uh, cases from a couple of our outyards. Uh, but they cleaned up pretty easily. We, uh, we were able to just remove them, and the bees kind of bounced back, and we haven't seen those cases. So... So we've had, uh, you know, you've got to be still diligent, but uh, you, you, you definitely start with an advantage. Wintering 
we've not seen a 30% loss in, oh, I haven't seen it in 15, 16 years. More like 10 or 15 is pretty, pretty, pretty typical. And I'm not saying we don't have some die-offs here and there. We're, we're spread out. we got a lot of yards sometimes. Some yards look worse than others. Uh, uh, I'm not trying to say that. You still have to be a good manager of bees. Take care of your bees. Swarming, they get criticized. we get criticized. Well, Russians love to swarm. Well, it's not that they love to swarm. It's just that they build up so quickly. And if you've not experienced that, uh, and by the way, any colony, whether it's Russian or Italian or whatever, if it builds up to a size, it's going to swarm on you. The difference with the Russians is you need to be splitting those colonies early in the spring, a lot earlier than some of the other bees. And if the conditions are good in the spring, you will see them uh, by uh, the end of May, just all of them wanting to swarm. And I've been caught short on that one a couple of times. And I can tell you, you come into a bee yard and it's nothing but bees in the trees. And that's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a tough spot to be. But we've got it figured out. We had very little problem with swarming in the past two years because what we've decided, we have a very proactive program where we go in and we equalize the brood in hives. We still brood and make nukes. Uh, we do this stuff on the early side and uh, we've kept our swarming at a minimal and by the way all those hives increase to be productive for honey the same year so we don't we don't really miss a beat on that we've seen the honey production grow as we've started selecting the best hives for that that's part of our breeding uh uh, requirement is we want to have our best honey producers as well as the other uh, mite control uh we know we know the mite Levels of, of Russian hives tends to be a lot lower than others. Uh, they aren't without mites, and you still have to treat on occasion, but you can go a long time. Some, sometimes you can skip years without any treatments and not really get punished for it. And uh, what would I say else about that? It's simply that uh, the other thing we have with the mites is they, if you do have an infestation and you, you employ some sort of treatment and knock those mites back, uh, those bees come back healthy fast. They don't, uh, they don't then die in the winter. They, come, they bounce back for you. So, so there's things like that that I would say seem to be much better in the Russian bees. And this has all pretty much been documented. I would, I would say this. The Russian bees, because of their, their uh, place in the, in the USDA program, uh, they might be some of the most uh, tested bees we have. Uh, there's been so many kinds of experiments on all kinds of things. And it's, by the way, it's all public. You can go to the, go, you can Google that and, and they've got all these bulletins published and you, you can go read them and see what the scientists have, have determined. Uh, but I would say those are some of the advantages. Dan, thanks for that. I, I just want kind of an update. Uh, it sounds like the program is moving in the right direction. Uh, you got an you you got a nice problem to have. You don't have enough bees, which is a nice problem to have. I mean, it'd be nice if ever, everybody could have <laughs> as many as they wanted, but you're gonna you don't have enough people making them. So, um, like I said, it's a nice problem to have. I, I just comment that we've done a better job with that. Some of the producers, uh, David Richard Coy, they moved their entire operation from Arkansas to Mississippi. By the way, which is no no small thing uh but they've stepped it up they supply all the package russian bees for kelly bees now and they're using they're using stock from the certified uh, uh you know breeding stock and uh that wasn't possible a few years ago and they're the only ones by the way still doing just they're, they're doing packages and they also do thousands and thousands of nukes now they're a pretty big operation and the quality of their, their bees is pretty good. They've got a couple of commercial beekeepers using Russians exclusively now out in the Dakotas and places like that. So uh, I think you're going to hear more about uh, availability. And uh, people have geared up to becoming more productive as far as raising bees. Hey, Dan, so what's the breakout of your producers? How many are producing queens and packages, et cetera? I think we've got eight members now that offer queens. And that might be 
you know, 100 or 200 queens a season, or it might be four or 6,000. So they're, they're getting the queen numbers up. We've got uh, six members now who really do sell the nukes and, at some scale. And uh, like I said, one member, the, the David and Richard Coy, selling packages. So all of them, by the way, last year, the Coys, I referred to, to the Coy brothers because they had, uh, at one point, David had a surplus of, I don't know what he had, three or 4,000 queens that he had no buyers for. And it was really interesting because he did sell them all within about three weeks. Once we got the word out, it was pretty amazing. So anyway, so we, we are increasing the availability. I started two new distributors up here in New England that work with me that are selling uh, nukes from certified uh, producers. And we're, we're getting, we're getting things rolling. You know, we, the organization does need more new blood. We added two new, two good members last year. Uh, they aren't certified yet, but hopefully they will be uh, shortly this season. I, I just want to mention that one of our really uh, original members, Carl Webb, passed away this past year, and, and Carl was a, a real advocate for the Russian honeybee. And, and those of you who knew Carl, he was he was quite a character to deal with. I, I miss him a lot. He was one of my staunchest allies at the board meetings and would often <laughs> help me out with some some uh, disagreements and uh and i will miss carl i'll miss carl a lot the good news there is uh, a lot of people also know virginia webb who's uh in her own right pretty well known in the bee community she is going to continue to raise carl's lines and stay in the association so that's uh that was a really good thing for us to to have her be willing to do. Dan, I'm going to steer you away from Russian bees for the moment because I want to. I want you to tell us about EAS that was supposed to be at UMass this year, and you were involved with some of the planning, and the world changed. So just briefly, what can people expect for e from EAS this year? That's a good question, Ken. Uh, yeah, EAS, uh, Massachusetts was going to host it this summer. And uh, as as everyone knows, we had the, the pandemic come along and that shut everything down. Uh, and we had some really big plans. Uh, personally, having been a lifetime member for EAS, I, I was hoping that in the next few years to see Massachusetts take it take it one more time uh, and uh, we had to we had to basically tell the uh, EAS leadership that we could not host it. The University of Massachusetts des decided that they would not uh, have any outside events on campus until next fall. Uh, so that pretty much uh, took away our plan. So we we bowed out. Uh, we're hoping we're going to get our get a shot at it again in 2023. So in the meantime, um, the EAS leaderships decided they still wanted to go on and try to have a conference so they have uh they asked other states who would be willing to take it on and and uh, good for kentucky they stepped up and uh the the initial information which more will come out if you're a if you're a member you'll get it in the next eas journal the details but generally speaking it's going to be august 11 through the 13th so just a three-day conference. But this will allow the master beekeeper testing to go on. This will uh, uh, unfortunately be limited to 300 attendees, no walk-ins, masks will be required, and they're encouraging people to try to get uh, vaccinated ahead of time. And the way it, at this way, at this time, it's gonna be, they're looking to have five presenters each day for three days. And that would be it. And as far as the, the, the social events right now, there's not too much planned that can change. They will have the uh, the barbecue, which they always have. And they'll they'll have the, the traditional award ceremony at the barbecue, probably. And there probably will be an auction if I know EAS. There'll be uh, no more of those <laughs> half paint buckets, Kim, that you and Aaron Morris used to bid on. Bid get on all the time by the yes. way we're sorry to hear that aaron passed away it's going to be uh, at the paraquet springs conference center in shepherdsville kentucky there'll be more coming out on that i'm sure once they they shore things up 
visit the EAS website and uh, uh, that there'll be more more information as they as they as they get it together. It's not good. I was looking forward to coming to Massachusetts this year uh, at the meeting. I haven't been to an EAS for a while and I was head, gonna head back, but I, I don't know about I don't know if I'll make it to the one this summer or not, but uh, thanks for passing that on. People can find out more at the EAS website. And if you're, like you said, if you're a member, you'll get it in the jur- journal. And if you're not, you'll, you can get it on the website. So uh, changed, but not, not dissolved. Uh, still going to have an EAS meeting. That's, that's good to hear. Yeah. It'll be different from the past, but as we, as we say, we're, we're learning to do things a new way now. So pretty much everything a new way now. All right. Uh, Jeff, got anything else for Dan? It's great learning and getting an update on the, the Russian bees. And uh, this is a great time of year to be talking about the different uh, uh, types of bees we can get as people consider what they are bringing into their yards this year. And uh, yeah, EAS, uh, just doggone it, the COVID has just really kind of screwed up everybody's plans for the yeah. another summer, it sounds like. So uh, hopefully EAS is able to sort that out. And I'm happy to hear they'll still have the testing. And uh, and having somewhat of a meeting, it's always a big draw on the East Coast. I admire the fact that they're going to push ahead with this. Yeah. Well, I look forward to it. I hope it works, Dan. Thank you for all of this. Um, We had Steve Coy on here a while back and and, uh, talking about uh, tallow and that problem. And and, um, we just mentioned a little bit about the Russians Mm -hmm. with him. It's good to talk to you again. I uh, Keep us up to date on what's going on with your program, all right? I certainly will, and uh, thank you guys for, for having me on. I appreciate it. Take care. Well, thanks for joining us. All right. Yeah, I was really glad to have Dan back on the show and, and uh, brought back uh, some of the great discussion we had earlier. Was it last year, the year before, with Tom Render and he, learning all that early history of the Russian Russian bee breeding program that was really fascinating. You've kept them, haven't you? Or you've you've worked with them? I've worked. I've worked. I've worked Dan's bees. I've been at his place working, right. uh, going through some of his colonies, and and the people that I know that have Russians, no complaints. I mean, you don't have to like. They're just like he said. You don't have to treat every year. Some years you don't have to treat at all. Some years maybe once. He's right. They build up fast in the spring. Get out of their way. Um, or they'll be in the trees, just like he said. But that's an <laughs> that's an asset to me. You know, that's yeah. not a problem. Uh, if you know it's coming, you make it. You know, make your splits early, and you got nukes for sale. Yeah, yeah. Or right. you're increasing your yard. Sounds like a good deal to me. I'd like to see if I can find you know, some breeders around here. And maybe get some um, just to try them out. Yeah, I think you should. Uh, and EAS, boy, what a. I'm I I I'm going to watch in awe, but I think I'm going to watch. Um, <laughs> I've been there, done that, and and I I don't think I'd want to try doing what they're doing this year with all of the with all of the constraints that they've got. But I hope it works for them, and next year will be better. Yeah, I give a lot of credit to all everybody across the country and around the world, for that matter, who are dealing with the ramifications of COVID. Uh, and and their bee meeting programs. I mean, look at uh, Jerry Bromenshank and WAS uh, and and what he's done. He's converted their uh, meetings into a monthly uh, Zoom meeting that's appeared to be pretty successful. Uh, and and all the communities around around the country I know are having Zoom monthly meetings. That's it's quite a wrench in the works. You know, I I, I mentioned Zoom. I did an article for. Uh... Jeremy's uh, Beekeepers Quarterly over in the UK, and I got to thinking about uh, Zoom and and learning how to use Zoom. And I went quickly to Amazon, and there have been at least so far uh, a dozen new books published on how to do Zoom. <laughs> would you believe there's a Zoom for dummies? <laughs> yeah, I would believe that. That's probably the first book out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it, it's. You know, you got to you got to do what you got to do. So you figure out a way to do it. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Well, kudos to everybody who's actually um, slaying that dragon and and making it work. And yep. good luck to EAS. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. 
Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website from clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. We also want to thank Strong Microbials for their support of this podcast. Check out their probiotic line at www.strongmicrobials.com. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else we should mention, Kim? Just one thing is that when you go to that webpage, there's a place to put comments about the show, and we encourage that. You definitely do. All right, stay safe, everyone.